Well, people, it's time to say goodbye. It's time to say goodbye to this colourful wallpaper behind me. It's time to say goodbye to all of the green slides that we've looked at over the last couple of months. It's time to say goodbye, actually, in the grand scheme of things, to the Life Centre and this cupboard I'm stood in talking to you from. It's time to say goodbye to this journey that we have been on through the book of Galatians over the last four months or so. And as we do look at these last few verses in the book of Galatians, I think what we're going to find is they are incredibly well timed for us. My name is Dave. I'm one of the leaders here at Life Church. This is, if this is the first or one of the first times you've joined us, it's great to have you here with us. And in these last few verses of the book of Galatians, we're going to find how it describes the perfect way to end a sermon series, the perfect way to return to physical meetings after a pandemic, and how it has three pleas for how we would go on with our lives. So let me read for us Galatians chapter 6, verses 6 to 18. Let the one who is taught the word share all good things with the one who teaches. Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. For whoever sows, that he will also reap. For the one who sows to his own flesh will from the flesh reap corruption. But the one who sows to the Spirit will from the Spirit reap eternal life. Let us not grow weary of doing good, for in due season we will reap if we do not give up. So then, as we have opportunity, let us do good to everyone and especially to those who are of the household of faith. See with what large letters I am writing to you and with my own hand. It is those who want to make a good showing in the flesh who would force you to be circumcised and only in order that they may not be persecuted for the cross of Christ. For even those who are circumcised do not themselves keep the law, but they desire to have you circumcised that they may boast in the flesh. But far be it from me to boast except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, by which the world has been crucified to me and I to the world. For neither circumcision counts for anything, nor uncircumcision, but a new creation. And as for all who walk by this rule, peace and mercy be upon them and upon the Israel of God. From now on, let no one cause me trouble, for I bear on my body the marks of Jesus. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit, brothers. Amen. Well, how does this mean what the perfect way to end a sermon series is. Galatians here has an instruction to us all that, that when we have been taught by others, we're to share good things with those who have taught us. And it doesn't place a particular role on who's doing the teaching, who's doing the learning there. It simply says whoever has taught. We all need this. Any Christian or anybody who's considering Christianity uh, would appreciate that there are things that we do not know that we need others to help us to know. Or there are things that we do know that we need others to help us to really understand and apply to ourselves. And the instruction here is that those who teach us, we should share with. The word to share in that sentence is the word that also means fellowship. So on one level, this could be understood to be saying, look, students and teachers, those who learn and those who give out learning, should be in partnership with one another. We don't learn simply like being blank sheets of paper that get scribbled all over by somebody else. And nobody teaches within Christianity as a kind of heartless, dry dissemination of information. No, the church is not supposed to be a place of purely transactional relationships. So how do we end a sermon series perfectly? 
we end it with thankfulness and with sharing. If you have been blessed by anybody who has taught you faithfully the word of God over these past few months as we've been going through the book of Galatians, share with them, share fellowship with them, thank them. Whether it's Annie or Chris, Sai or James, Nathan or John or the other John, tell them if they have blessed you and thank them for blessing you. Be in fellowship with them. But it's not only that. To, the instruction to share as fellowship, all good things almost certainly means material things and financial support. If you have been blessed by those who have blessed you through God's word, seek to bless them. And you know, that would make us incredibly distinctive. Um, I have now been preaching for um, just over 15 years. When I worked that out, I felt incredibly old. Can I tell you something that happens to people when they tend to preach? Um, the first couple of times you speak, the... Um, Lots of people will give you a great deal of encouragement. Um, but then after you've spoken a couple of times, you'll just get a little bit of encouragement from maybe people who are particularly close to you. And then once you've started speaking regularly, um, you will hear mostly nothing. If you absolutely crush one, really nail it, you'll get some kind of muted encouragement. And if you're below par, you just have a bad day at the office one time, you'll hear lots about it. Life Church, let us be the kind of church that demonstrates the way of grace in a really distinctive manner. That we who have learnt from those who have taught us would share good things with those who have taught us. And that sharing of good things makes the, makes the sharing the fellowship, something much deeper, because it, it means it's not a merely transactional relationship. Just as teachers share their spiritual gifts with God's people and those who are learning, so those who learn share their financial, material, whatever gifts they have with those who have taught them. There is a really simple and plain way of understanding this that would probably make a big difference for most of us most of the time. Those of us who, those of us in the church who are taught are mostly taught by those who work for the church in a paid way. And so the simple and unglamorous way of us being faithful to what the Bible teaches in these verses is for us to give regularly, consistently and generously with a joyful heart to the finances of the church. Always doing so in the context that the whole of the book of Galatians has been written in of grace. Not giving as a way of earning our salvation, not giving as a way of, of earning the approval of other people, but giving because we have a thankful heart for all that God has done for us and a thankful heart for the fellowship that we enjoy and how others serve us as well. The context of grace is to underline everything that we do. Okay, I can see how this passage does directly say something about how you should end the sermon series, Dave, but I'm struggling to see how, how a, a book of the Bible written uh, thousands of years ago can possibly say what the perfect way to return to physical meetings is after a pandemic. Well, look at what it says in Galatians 6 verse 10. So then, as we have opportunity, let us do good to everyone, and especially those who are a household of faith. The opportunity to see one another again, whether it's in church or, or whether the opportunity to see one another again one another again in a cafe or seeing your family again, seeing your friends again, is, is, is exciting. But it's also confusing. As we enter and go through these next phases of easing of restrictions, most of us will experience two kinds of experience. Either a consumer experience or the experience of seeing family and friends. 
Consumer experiences are things like uh, when you go and get your hair cut, or when you uh, go shopping again, going back to the gym, going back to the office. And the thing about those consumer experiences is we will find ourselves saying, I certainly have found myself saying things like either, I am so impressed with how they have handled all of these things that they have to do. Or we'll find ourselves going, it is just ridiculous. I cannot believe they are doing this or not doing that. But when we're not in consumer experiences, when we're seeing our family and friends once again, our experience will be marked by going, I am so glad to see you. Last week, we had four of our closest friends come around and we haven't seen them together for so long. And in the afternoon before they got there, as I was cleaning the barbecue and getting the fire pit ready in the garden, I found myself thinking, my heart is so full. Do good to everybody, especially the household of faith. The church is not supposed to be a place of purely transactional relationships. And so our returning to physical meetings together, whether that's on Sundays or in life groups or in the wealth of other opportunities that we have just to choose to see each other once again is an opportunity for us to do good to one another and to treat one another as a household, as a family, as friends. The church is not supposed to be a place of purely transactional relationships. It's not supposed to be a consumer experience it's supposed to be a family reunion. And I'm so excited to see you again. But I have a warning here. Well, and I, when I say a warning, perhaps I think I mean more of a confession. And that is that it is so easy for us to slip into consumer way of thinking even about our family. Over the past couple of weeks, we have had the chance to see some of our wider family again. We haven't seen them much over the last, well, year because most of them live a fair way away from where we do. And so the chance to kind of meet up in gardens and in parks and things like that over the last few weeks has been a real privilege. But then we found ourselves having a conversation in the kitchen the other day where we started reviewing the interactions that we'd had with our family on the basis of how much fun they were to be around in terms of how they how comfortable they were with social interactions and whilst it was a kind of tongue-in-cheek silly conversation of comparing our family who I'm really hoping none of them are tuning in today I I found myself thinking afterwards as I was thinking about this and thinking about the church thinking that is no way to treat your family is it even if we try and most of the time think in a way of I'm so glad to see you. We so easily switch back into that way of consumer reviewal of treating one another. But the church is not supposed to be a place where we treat one another purely out of transactional relationships. We are a family. We are friends. We are the household of God. And I cannot wait to see you again. Then, Paul ends this book of Galatians with three pleas. I once read somebody describe how Paul's teaching can always be categorised in one of two ways. Um, the first way is what Paul, where Paul kind of wears his theological hat and he says things like, um, look, we are heirs of the most incredible promise and riches through faith in Christ Jesus, who has dealt with all of our sin and shame and has saved us by faith in him to eternal life in the family of God. Hallelujah. But then sometimes Paul takes off that kind of theological hallelujah hat and puts on a hat that could maybe be described as going... I am begging you, please, as apparently the only adult in the room, stop acting crazy. Well, in the book of Galatians, there's been plenty of the first hat, hasn't there? 
There's been plenty of Paul going, look, you have been counted right before God, not on the basis of your obedience to the law, nor on the basis of how good you are at anything, but you have been counted right before God because you have trusted in Jesus Christ. And Jesus Christ has given you all of his righteousness and he has taken away all of your all of your unrighteousness he has poured blessing upon blessing on you and you have access to god through grace and grace alone he has not just counted you righteous before him but he has adopted you as one of his own children he wants you to know him as his father who loves you in a way not dependent on your past actions or your future actions but he loves you as a father loves their child and not only that he loves you and has made you an heir an heir with Jesus, that you have the most amazing inheritance coming to you, an inheritance that has been kind of guaranteed by the fact that you have the Holy Spirit living in you, that even now you living in a way that is at all like Jesus and emulating him does not come through your hard works alone, but is the grace of God and the gift of the Spirit working out in you. Hallelujah. And Paul ends the letter with three pleas. I am begging you, he says. What are those three pleas? Well, let's look at verses 7 to 10. And the plea, first of all, to sow. Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatever one sows, that will he also reap. For the one who sows to his own flesh will from the flesh reap corruption. But the one who sows to the Spirit will from the Spirit reap eternal life. Let us not grow weary of doing good. For in due season we will reap if we do not give up. So then, as we have opportunity, let us do good to everyone and especially to those who are of the household of faith. Paul pleads with us that we would sow, that we would invest not in the flesh but in the spirit. And as anybody who has ever worked on a farm or uh, looked after a garden or beavered around in an allotment or these strange people who've got into the, uh, the practice known as gardening, you can find all sorts of strange things on the internet. Anybody who's done any of things knows that you only get the joy of harvesting the things that you sow and nurture. There may be months of waiting and unsure progress in between, but there is joy in the harvest at the end. And if you do not sow, and if you do not nurture, or if you sow the wrong things and nurture to the wrong things, and if you neglect, the only thing that you will harvest is the consequences of that. It may take months, even years for them to come around, but that is what you will find eventually. So to the spirit and not to the flesh, Paul pleads, pleads with us. This is how uh, Bunyan put it in Pilgrim's Progress. This hill, though high, I covet to ascend. The difficulty will not me offend. For I perceive the way of life lies here. Come, pluck heart, let's neither faint nor fear. Better, though difficult, the right way to go than wrong, though easy, where the end is woe. So to the spirit and not the flesh, even though it may be hard and persevere in doing so, Paul says. We automatically think, if the choice is between sowing to the spirit and sowing to the flesh, that the choice is between uh, kind of obviously sinful things and just any kind of religion. But Paul has gone to painful lengths over the course of this book to show us that the, the flesh can mean those obviously sinful things of lust and greed and anger and hate. But it can also mean 
those much more respectable sins, sins that everybody feels like you don't need to do as much to deal with, that quiet pride, independence, uh, stubbornness and gossip. But the flesh can also mean a kind of religion of the flesh, a religion of obedience that tries to control God with our good behaviour. And Paul pleads with us, don't sow to that. Sow to the spirit. Sow to that which is what saved you in the first place. Sow to depending on the gospel and enjoying what Jesus has done for you already and persevere in doing so. Anybody who's a bit new to gardening or gardening or farming knows that there's a, a period of anxiety waiting to see if crops will grow. The more experienced farmer, the more experienced Paul says, it's worth the wait, it's worth the patience. Keep sowing to the spirit and you will reap what you sow. Keep it up. What does that keeping it up look like? Verse 10 describes it simply as doing good. Christian obedience is not primarily about meetings or programs or projects, but it is about doing good to the person and the people who are in front of you, giving them what is best for them, sowing to the Spirit. That is Paul's first plea. Paul's second plea is his plea to boast, verses 11 to 15. See with what large letters I am writing to you, with my own hand. It is those who want to make a good showing in the flesh who would force you to be circumcised and only in order that they may not be persecuted for the cross of Christ. For even those who are circumcised do not themselves keep the law, but they desire to have you circumcised that they may boast in your flesh. But far be it from me to boast except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, by which the world has been crucified to me and I to the world. For neither circumcision counts for anything, nor uncircumcision, but a new creation. Paul's reached the point where he's ripped the pen out of the scribe's hand. He is now manically scrawling himself and he wants people to boast in the cross. Far be it from me to boast in anything except the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, by which the world has been crucified to me and I have been crucified to the world. The cross is the only thing that is worth boasting in because it has given us so much. It is worth boasting in and being excited about because it has all that we know it has given to us. It has given us right standing before God. It has given us freedom from all of our sin, a, a liberation from all of our guilt, a hope for the future, the promise of eternal life, a, a God who we can call our father, a a saviour, Jesus, who we can call our brother and our friend, a spirit who lives within us. That is a cross worth boasting in. But because it is a cross, it's almost an anti-boasting because it's the great humbler that says all of these things that we have, we didn't deserve in the first place. Boast in the cross, Paul pleads. And his final plea is that we would walk. Verse 16, as for all who walk by this rule, peace and mercy be upon them and upon the Israel of God. The image that you have been seeing at the beginning and at the end of every one of these talks in Galatians over the last four months has been the image of the main character in the book Pilgrim's Progress, who sought to walk the way of grace. That character who said, what I said earlier, this hill though high, I covet to ascend, the difficulty will not me offend, for I perceive the way of life lies here, come pluck heart, let's neither faint nor fear, better though difficult the right way to go, than wrong though easy, where the end is woe. 
Paul's final plea is to walk the way of grace. It is acknowledging that there is a way of knowing the gospel and never really knowing the gospel. A way of being able to say it, recognise it, recount it, but never knowing it. And there is a way of knowing the gospel and being utterly transformed by it. By a way of knowing the gospel and having it transform the way you think, the way your, your heart beats, the way your gut feels, the way your body acts, who you are. Paul, please, that we would walk that way. Walk in the way of grace. Stay in step with the Spirit. That does leave us with a question, I think, or probably not a question, but a bunch of questions. about Well, how do you do that? What does that look like? What does it practically really look like to walk the way of grace in my friendships, in my work, in my family life, in when life is bad, when life is good, and when in a host of other areas? Well, the message of Galatians has been that walking the way of grace does not happen by saying that, well, grace was a, a great way on to Christianity, but now we need to come up with a load of rules to understand how to kind of process all these different scenarios. No, the message of Galatians has been the way in is the way on. That Christian maturity comes through applying God's grace that has saved us to all of those different circumstances and situations that everyday life throws at us. And so in a couple of weeks time, that is what we're going to turn our attention to. Thinking through all sorts of the circumstances of everyday life, friendships, our work, family, our relationships, our... when life is good and when life is bad, and thinking through what does the grace of God look like when applied to these situations. Because we believe that grace and the grace of God has the power to change everything. Because some news is so powerful that it will always change the way you see everything else. Um, when Mim and I were uh, dating, um, we were long distance dating for a while. We would only see each other every couple of weekends. I lived in Southampton at the time. Mim lived in Oxford. And one weekend, um, during the stage of life where Mim was finishing her teacher qualifications and was applying for jobs in teaching, uh, Mim had come down to Southampton to see me for the weekend. Um, and a matter of minutes after she arrived here, we were walking through West Quay Shopping Centre and Mim got the phone call from the head teacher of a school for a job that she had applied for, that she really wanted, to be told the news, I'm sorry, but we're not accepting your application. Mim was devastated. She cried in a, a corner of West Quay shopping centre. Despite the fact that she had the immense privilege of being able to spend the weekend with me. Despite the fact that she had the utter joy of it being Saturday and Sunday and not having to go to work again until Monday. Despite the, the overwhelming joy surely she would appreciate at me being her boyfriend. She was devastated. I hope you can detect I'm being a little bit ironic here. Um, what does that show us? It shows that, look, sometimes We've all experienced in life how, how some news has the power to overwhelm any other news that might be going on in our lives. That is the kind of impact that the grace of God should have in our lives. It is the kind of good news that is such powerful, potent and transcendent good news that it permeates and affects the way we see everything else that is going on in our lives. As for all who walk this way of grace, peace and mercy be upon you. Amen.